Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today we're going to be talking about glaucoma. It's estimated, well, reported that approximately 2.5 to 3 million people have glaucoma in the United States that are diagnosed and probably many, many more uh, that don't know they have it. What it is, is this group of eye diseases in which the fluid pressure inside the eye rises, and, which is 85% of the time, and about 15% of the time due to poor blood flow to the optic nerve, 15% of the time can cause glaucoma. It's characterized by a subtle loss of side peripheral vision, and if untreated, it can progress to a loss of central vision and lead to blindness. It's the second leading cause of blindness in the United States. There are two different kinds, um, primarily most diagnosed. The open angle, uh, the fluid drains too slowly uh, from the anterior chamber of the eye, and then the Peripheral vision narrows, the pupils will dilate, become dilated and fixed, uh, not responding to light. That's kind of how you can kind of know initially if you have it. And then there's an increase in eye pressure. Um, closed angle, which is much more dangerous and requires immediate, immediate medical attention. Uh, you have intense pain in one eye with blurred vision, nausea and vomiting, swollen eyelids, red watery eyes, and it happens at about 10% uh, uh, of the time. Uh, very, very, very severe, needs immediate attention, and boy, a lot of people just might think they might have a severe migraine and this can get undiagnosed and leave them with permanent damage. Um, the causes of glaucoma are many, um, and some we probably don't know entirely about. Stress, uh, nutritional problems, the lack of certain nutrients can contribute to it, diabetes, and then high blood pressure alone, since we know high eye, pre high eye pressure uh, lending itself probably from high blood pressure, but they're not necessarily both at the same time. Uh, excessive glutamic acid uh, can contribute. Uh, it's a type of an amino acid in the body. If certain aminos aren't present, you'll have a higher glutamic acid uh, amount. Race. If you're um, black, Asian, you tend to have more of these issues from age 40 onward. Most people don't see glaucoma until they're about 60 above, but black and Asian Americans from about 40 on above should be checked for glaucoma specifically because of the increased rate in those particular races. Um, nitric oxide deficiency. Um, nitric oxide is a vaso, uh, the blood vessels will vasodilate, which re reduces blood pressure and eye pressure. A lot of people are nitric oxide deficient. Uh, collagen loss. Primarily, apparently caused an awful lot by the lack of vitamin C and the usage of cortical steroids, which causes those thin uh, uh, collagen membranes to deteriorate, disintegrate. So if there is a family history of that or um, a history of nearsightedness, macular degeneration, uh, physicians really need to double think putting their patients on any long-term usage of cortical steroids. Uh, antidepressants, blood pressure meds also can contribute to glaucoma. I know you kind of think, but if you look at your little side effects that come with it, that's some of the side effects. We've defined it and we've kind of given you some basic causes. Now I'm going to go over to the chart here and review with you what we can do about it. Uh, it seems to all stem a lot from the diet. Everything that we talk about in this show, every breath out of one side, each side of my mouth is diet, diet, diet. Alkaline the diet based on an alkaline diet based on fruits and veggies and whole grains. Um, decreasing the amount of sugar, alcohol that you consume because you spike the sugars, you spike the insulin, it causes inflammation in the vascular system and these little capillaries in the eyes, they're very small and they're very, very, very delicate and they're easily damaged by pressure and uh, anytime you have high amounts of sugar, including alcohol. Avoiding caffeine-rich foods, caffeine, vasoconstriction, so obviously you're gonna see an increase in blood pressure and the same that goes with nicotine when you smoke. When you smoke, it causes vasoconstriction again. In addition, smoking causes a uh, usage of vitamin C at, at astronomical levels, 25 to 50 milligrams a cigarette. So if you smoke a pack a day, 
you get, you're destroying a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, so the collagen is not able to replenish itself and keep those uh, capillaries in the eyes strong. Um, increase your consumption of carotenoids, and carotenoids are yellows, oranges. Those are good. Squash, carrots, um, all those types of things. Uh, they're going to be within that color range, uh, and reds as well too in your tomato family tomato family types of, of uh, reds. Um, purples as well, purple cabbage, eggplant, all those kinds of things are all colors. So the more colors you get in the carotenoid field, the better. Eat blueberries and cherries. I'll talk about some studies later on, but blueberries and cherries, um, lots of research on them to help with capillary strength and integrity and the reduction of acidity, uh, particularly in the vascular system. Eight glasses of water a day. I have to say, I think probably over 50% of my customers, when they come in, I'll ask them about, well, how much water are you getting? Because they complain about various issues, and the first, well, oftentimes the thing out of my mouth is, are you getting eight glasses of water a day? And if you're a guy and you're active, 10 to 12 glasses of water a day, and most of them are. So how can you expect things to flow well unless you give yourself water. So you got to have that water. Eating safe fish, um, your uh, Alaskan salmon, safe, and, and there's lists you can go online and look up that tend to have lower mercury and PCB and all the chemicals uh, in them that you can eat one to three times a week. But we'll talk about some other ways of doing that in supplementation that you can get past that, particularly if you don't like fish. I have a couple of kids that don't like fish. Um, Supplement-wise, the most research is what I've gone after here. Every single thing that I'm going to list on here that you can utilize to help either prevent or help with if you have glaucoma has been extremely, very, very well researched. So I don't want anybody out there, physician or otherwise, to say, uh, -uh this is all researched. Okay, and some of the studies I'll cite specifically. Vitamin C, ester C in particular, 2,000 milligrams. Uh, twice a day, collagen production lowers eye pressure, uh, improves fluid outflow. outflow. It's going to make those capillaries more flexible. Remember, collagen is necessary for the flexibility and pliability in our skin, our vascular system, hair, nails, all those wonderful things. Um, lots of research. I mean, I could list, I came across five studies just in what I was looking at. So lots of studies support that's very, very necessary. Bioflavonoids, particularly rutin, 500 milligrams twice a day. It prevents vitamin C breakdown. And that's that little white stuff we don't tend to like to eat in our grapefruits and oranges. Yummy, yummy. Um, it improves the capillary integrity and also helps stabilize the collagen matrix. So doing like a, a, an ester C or a mineral ascorbate vitamin C with bioflavonoids, an absolute must in anybody who has glaucoma. Uh, magnesium. Lowers eye pressure, relaxes blood vessels. We recommend this, so our, our, our customers come in and grab magnesium as a vasorelaxer. I have physicians who recommend it for migraine headaches for, as a vasorelaxer. It relaxes the blood vessels, can lower eye pressure as well. Three to 600 milligrams, preferably a magnesium citrate form or orotate or aspartate form. They're much more biologically available than oxide forms that I see written on scripts from docs. Ginkgo biloba. Once again, there was a study, in, and this is listed in the ophthalmology, should underline that journal. Uh, 60 milligrams twice a day resulted in a significant increase in the field of vision. Remember I told you the, with glaucoma, particularly in the open angle, you're going to lose that peripheral? Well, this helps with widening the peripheral, increases circulation, um, but obviously if you're on blood thinners, ginkgo biloba, not a good idea. Alpha lipoic acid. Another study showed a 47.5% uh, of the patients taking 100 to 200 milligrams, and, and I usually suggest 100 milligrams twice a day, uh, of alpha lipoic acid. Very strong antioxidant for the eyes, the liver, very anti-aging, actually helps with blood sugars, diabetic neuropathy, and especially with diabetics that have uh, uh, glaucoma, which is a quite common occurrence because the eyes usually in diabetes are one of the first things to go because the sugars just absolutely destroy those small little capillaries in the eyes. Good multiple vitamin, high in Bs, aids the healing and reduces the eye pressure. 
First words out of my mouth after I ask about water is, what kind of, are you taking a good multivitamin? And I'm not talking about one from one of the major chains that has a four or 5% absorption rate. I'm talking about a good multiple vitamin that has a high B vitamin content. An absolute must if you've got glaucoma. We're gonna flip the page over here. Ha 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 All right, natural vitamin E. Not only is natural vitamin E slightly thin the blood, but it also helps remove particles from the, forget that T, lens of the eye. So vitamin E is very, very helpful for the eye and a lot of other things as well. It actually lessens the chances of a heart attack by over 50% in diabetics as well. So very, very important with diabetics that have glaucoma. Glutathione. Protects the lens of the eye, maintains the integrity of the eye, and the fiber membranes of the eye. Needs to be taken on an empty stomach. It's one of the strongest antioxidants known to man for the, livers and obvious, for the liver and obviously for the eyes as well. Vitamin A. There's a big, seems to be big disputes over how much vitamin A people can take safely that doesn't store around the liver. And all the studies that I ran into all utilized a minimum of 25,000 IUs of vitamin A. Unless you're pregnant, you don't exceed 10,000. That's what the studies say. Needed for good eyesight without vitamin A or some type of natural beta carotene, not synthetic, natural beta carotene sources, hmm, you're not gonna see very well. Vitamin A is known as the eye vitamin, okay? Essential fatty acids. I have a lot of people that have um, dry eye in conjunction with uh, glaucoma. These essential fatty acids help reduce inflammation in the vascular system and they help moisturize the eyes, keep things moving and, and uh, less inflamed. Very, very important. You can get those from nuts or you can take a supplement of an omega-369 of fatty acids. Um, fish oil as well has been shown to reduce inflammation and eye pressure too and blood pressure as well because it reduces inflammation. Zinc. Without adequate amounts of zinc, and, and you can usually get that in a good multiple vitamin, uh, in minimum of 15 milligrams, most of the studies were done on 25 uh, to 50 milligrams, it activates vitamin A. Hmm. So you can't make the key vitamin for the eye work unless you have zinc, which is also really important for male prostate as well too. So necessary in a multivitamin, multimineral to have zinc in there as well. Kudzu. Okay, now we have, as, you, as I mentioned before, there are some blood pressure medications that contribute to glaucoma, and it's point blank. I can remember going through with my dad on his meds when he was taking them, which he no longer does, for blood pressure. And he would, that would be, that was one of the side effects, was glaucoma, and I'll be doggone, my dad now has glaucoma. So, what can you say? There are some things, some alternatives that you can research and consider. Kudzu, which is an herb that we talked about last uh, a couple weeks ago for alcoholism, because it can make you nauseous if you uh, take kudzu to keep uh, from drinking alcohol, is a natural beta blocker. Okay, beta blockers help slow the heart down, lower the blood pressure. Coleus for scolin is a, a vascular uh, dilator, reduces the blood pressure as well, but it's also an anti-inflammatory. I remember taking coleus for skull and I was taking it, I had some inflammation and I have relatively low blood pressure. And I can remember going to a doc for an ear infection in, in Solvang and him asking me what the heck I was doing because my blood pressure was like 90 over 55 and it's like a little low there because the coleus had reduced my, uh, my blood pressure. So it can be used for blood pressure but studies have supported it also reduces eye pressure. Now we talked and touched on a little bit about cortical steroids misspelled again here, I'm sorry about that, eats away collagen, okay? So if you're sitting there doing your inhalers and you don't really, really need them, or you're on prednisone for a lengthy period of time, remember collagen just isn't in the eyes, it's in the joints, it's in the skin, it's in the vascular system, it's throughout the body. So, mm, corticosteroids, only short-term usage. Beta blockers commonly pre pre prescribed for glaucoma can increase LDL, and triglycerides, in addition to increasing hip fractures by three times. I never thought in terms of a beta blocker medication increasing my chances of falling and breaking my hip by three times. So consider that as well, but 
increases your LDL. So if you have a cholesterol issue and a triglyceride issue, you may need to be considering something alternatively to a beta blocker. Ephedra and nicotine uh, or those types of base drugs, cocaine, obviously contributes to uh, vasoconstriction and will also increase eye pressure. <sighs> we talk about exercise almost on every show and oftentimes I can't find direct studies that say, okay, this actually lessens the chances of that happening or decreases the amount of pressure in, for example, in the eye. But a uh, study I found, 30 minutes of exercise just three times a week, not even every day, lowered pressure 20% or more for open angle, which is the most common type of glaucoma, 20%. So there was tons of case studies that I ran across that literally listed using the supplementation alone without medications. And you can use these supplementation or these products I've listed with medications except for some of the blood thinners. Uh, in a safe fashion and see if it doesn't work for you first before you know before you try some of the medications that come with some of the side effects under your healthcare pr practitioner supervision of course always next we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show thank you Welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today I'm going to focus in on the neck and the circulation in the back of the neck. Hmm. A lot of people towards the middle or the end of the day from being slumped over the desk or just slumping over, period, um, find themselves very, very tired. And sometimes the circulation to the brain and to the spine isn't so good. So I'm going to show you an exercise, very basic movements. You can sit down in a chair like I am, particularly if you don't. I worry about getting dizzy whenever we're turning the head, so I think seated is always best. And all you're going to do is you're going to go down, put your chin all the way here, and we're going to go back, down, and back, down, and back, and maybe about five times. And then we're going to go from side to side, side to side, and just um, back and forth, not pushing it too much. Now you can go faster, but you don't have to. The key is, is try to get circulation going into that back of that, the blood in the back of the, of the neck. What's really nice about this exercise too, as you're moving things along, you can do things that kind of stretch it out as you're moving along and so it can become a neck toning exercise so that we can turn one exercise into two. Try that when you're feeling tired and see if that doesn't wake you up. We're going to be moving on next to the research portion of our show. Thanks. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. Sorry about that. We heard a, hear a cell phone ringing and it's like in this uh, arena we try to keep things quiet. With us today once again is uh, Ralph Turciano. Ralph's going to be presenting the latest greatest research and we really appreciate his help on the show. Ralph? Thank you for the intro. All right, for eczema suffer sufferers, well a lot of you believe that eczema is an autoimmune condition and you've been told that and treated for eczema. But in most of the known world, eczema is known to be triggered by allergic reaction to certain materials. Number one on that list, obviously, is nickel. Number two is cobalt. But there is a third, very common and very pervasive in our environment. And what they found out at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, it's something called linolol. That's L-I-N-A-L-O-O-L. Now, where is this found? Well, it's a common fragrance that they use in cosmetics. Your shampoos, your soaps, and things along those lines. But you don't have to apply it. Someone else can be wearing it. It's the oxidized form of linolol that causes the eczema reaction. And how many people does this affect? 
Well, according to the University of Gothenburg, in, again, in Sweden, it affects up to 5% of the population. So that's a pretty high amount. That's about 1 in 20. And the interesting part about it is it just doesn't have to be a single exposure. What occurs, you can be exposed to this in your shampoo or soap or wherever it is one time, but as it accumulates throughout the day, you come in contact with people in the gym, you use a hand sanitizer in the bathroom, whatever it is, it begins to increase propensity to create that eczema type reaction. Originally, when they released this chemical that was found in your cosmetics and your soaps and everything else like that, they were told it was only a 1% reaction rate. Well, 5 to 7% minimum of your population. So those people are eczema sufferers taking a lot of things for autoimmune. Look in your bathroom cupboard, look in your detergents, and look around you. See if you can avoid it for a little while and just maybe you get a little bit of true relief as opposed to a medicated relief. Outside of that, blood pressure. They found that the protein from your typical garden peas had an incredible effect in the reduction of blood pressure. Now albeit, this study was originally done in rodents or mice. After about an eight week period of time of eating proteins derived from garden peas, the results in blood pressure drop were 20%. That was 20%. Now keep in mind, this was the protein extracted from the peas. You're probably not going to get the same results just by eating garden peas. Yes, you may get some results, but not as dramatic as they did in the studies. And this article was released in the American Chemical Society's 237th National Meeting. So. Interesting enough, they found out you could take common food and actually do a better job than most medications. And it's out there. And so give it a couple of years, it'll come in a condensed form, but otherwise there's pea proteins out there you can buy. And just give it a shot and see if it gives you a little bit extra freedom away from those medications. This one's for my Gulf War veteran friends. A lot of people out there in the, from the Gulf War have complained about tons of maladies and ailments and got no relief from the government. Well, for once, to begin to find out there's a way to actually test for Gulf War syndrome. They discovered that Gulf War veterans who are coming back, they had less white matter on the brain. This is usually a response to exposure to either sarin gas or pesticides. Well, now they discovered something else, that the brain itself has a hard time responding to what's called cholinergenic or cholinergenic uh, neurotransmitters, per se. They found out that this item, which can be found in pesticides as well as nerve gas, you have to remember a lot of people that went to the Gulf War put mosquito repellent all over the body, affected the basal ganglia, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the amygdala, huh, the, and also, again, other parts of the brain that affected memory, body pain, fatigue, emotional response, personality changes, everything else along those lines. They found out they can test for it. Also, to test if there was exposure, there is an enzyme called peroxinase that basically, if you were exposed to these pesticides or sarin gas, would be diminished in the blood because the body requires this enzyme to get rid of those substances and the people that are prone to it have low levels of these enzymes. This was printed in the, journal, uh, the March issue of the journal Psychiatry Re uh, Research in regards to neuro neuroimaging, just in case you need to reference that. All right. Back to insecticides, seems to be a common drum these days for beating. Exposure to insecticides may actually result in obesity. We reported on this before, but again, it's being confirmed again. This was from the pesticide, which was given a few generations ago, which seems to just keep on being passed on from one generation to the next. It's not exiting our system. And that was DDT, otherwise sometimes converted to the body of DDE. This has not been eliminated. It's not produced in the United States, but it's used in a large portion of the world. What they found out was the offspring, the children born to the people exposed to this pesticide, basically had weight gains or above the average weight from 13 to 20 pounds. The higher the exposure to the pesticide, the more the weight was added on. And again, this was just the offspring of the children exposed to pesticides many years ago. The research was done on 250 mo mothers, and this was done, to, this you'll find in the uh, Occupation and Environmental Medicine issue of this month, April. All right, now for morbid obesity. Often we tend to think that we tend to move a lot more than we actually do. Well, they recently did a study, and this was in the issue of clinical cardiology, 
They wanted to examine the average fitness level of those who are morbid obese. What they discovered was this. People that were morbidly obese did nothing for 99% of the day. They walked or got up just an average of 8.4 minutes through the total 24 hours. Hardly anything. But they also discovered this, that those that were morbidly obese, if they just walked an average of one to two miles an hour, one to two miles an hour, not talking walking one to two miles, just a little bit, they reduced the chance of dying from cardiac arrest or cardiac problems by 71%. Doesn't take a lot to do a lot. Think about that. All right, fast one, bladder cancer. I had to bring this one up anyways. A lot of people being treated for bladder cancer, well, they discovered this. Researchers at the University of Virginia uh, Health Systems found that one of the genes that were commonly thought to promote the growth and spread of cancer actually fights it. It's called the SRC gene. And they found out when they removed it, cancer spread like wildfire. The gene was there because it was fighting the cancer, not because it was causing the cancer. So they said, Dad, anybody being treated for bladder cancer should seriously reconsider how they're being treated until further notice. Now we look at our oversight. They was a company out there. You wonder how these drugs get promoted for clinical trials and how they decide who to test for these trials and who not to and how this whole process goes about. Oh, I want to be part of a clinical trial. Well, they came up with a phony company with the guy had no license, no identifications, no nothing. Came out with a fake drug called the Hesiobolic, which basically was a crazy glue that you consumed that's hopefully stopped the stomach from bleeding. And by general line, give you an idea, the heads of this company were named April Foolis, Timothy Whitless, and the company was the chairman of the company was a three-legged dog. This company got approved to medical test on people, even though the company never existed. And just something to think about. And they said too, we realized this was a terrible risk for the patient when they actually looked at it. It was the worst thing they've ever seen. And they could have got away with testing people on it. Now, go, let's go back to the time caps a little bit. About melamine. And it rushes up just a little fast. Remember that all the melamine poisoning was out there and all the people are having kidney failure and functions and things like that back in October uh, of 2008? And the government said, no illnesses have been reported in the US, but authorities are checking for any telltale increase in reports of kidney problems. Bunch of BS. What they came out with? More kids today are having kidney problems than anything else. In fact, they see a five-fold increase. When there used to be one report of a kidney problem per year, they're finding an average of five per week in each individual hospital. Something to think about. The FDA is not doing anything in regards to looking out for you, the NIH or the CDC. So if your kid's having kidney problems, check his food. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate, appreciate the information. Once again, do your research. Look into all of this. Take charge of your health. Thank you very much.